Okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Cindy Meyer. I'm with Warren County Water <coughs> Conservation District. And this morning is our third and final Ag Chat for 2021. So welcome everyone. And I want to thank our, our sponsor today, which is Warren County Farm Bureau. Um, this has been a great partnership um, between our district and um, Warren County Farm Bureau. And I wanted to give Ashley a few minutes here um, to just say a, a few words about Farm Bureau. Thanks, Cindy. Um, we really appreciate this partnership too. Um, Soil and Water is such a great resource in our community. And we've had a lot of fun partnering with them and figuring out speakers that would be entertaining for all of you. Um, I wanted to start off by uh, saying happy Friday and letting you know that for all of our Farm Bureau members, whether you wanna be a new member or renew, we are holding a membership day tomorrow at Rule King. Um, we'll start at 8 a.m. and we'll be wrapped up by noon. But if you come and renew or you join Farm Bureau, we'll give you a $10 gift card to a local business. We just felt that was so important, especially in the middle of this pandemic, um, to help support our local businesses. You can also pick up your $5,000 reward sign. Um, we got these last year, literally right before the pandemic hit. So we haven't really gotten the chance to give them out to our members. So we wanna make sure that everyone has the opportunity to grab that in their own county so they don't have to drive to our Wilmington office to do so. Um, we also have a scholarship program going on right now. So all of our scholarship applications can be found online at our website. Um, you can also find links to it on our Facebook page, but those applications are due April 1st, and then we will hold scholarship interviews on April 17th. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to my office. Um, we're also gearing up for summer and fair events, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, things are looking a lot better for the summer and the ability to have events. So we're really excited for that. A big time for Warren County Farm Bureau is during the Warren County Fair. And we wanted to make sure people knew that we plan to have our milk booth. Um, so you can swing by the milk booth and pick up your chocolate milk or your strawberry milk or your water. Um, we'll also have the 4-H t-shirts for the kids as well as t-shirts that we'll sell out of our booth. And then a big thing for us is on Thursday, July 22nd, during the hog sale, we do our Feed Our Neighbors project. So what that project does is it allows um, members of the community to bid on 4 h hog projects. And then instead of either having to take that meat home themselves or sell it to the packer, they have the opportunity to donate it to a local family in need. So how that works is Farm Bureau covers the cost of the shipping and the processing, we take those hogs and we give them to Sugar Harvest Food Bank, who then distributes them to seven area pantries for us, all in Warren County. Um, and it really does help feed hungry neighbors and supports our kids. So I really hope that you'll join us for that event. Um, if you have any questions or want to stay connected to us, feel free to follow us on Facebook. But thanks, Cindy. We really appreciate this opportunity and we really love these ag chats. You've done a great job putting them together. Yes, thank you, Ashley. That's great. We hope fair happens too. <laughs> we hope a lot of things happen this year <laughs> that we couldn't do last year. So thank you for your partnership. Um, I did want to say that uh, we have lots of things going on um, throughout the year. And of course, a lot of things have been virtual. Um, but to stay up to date, I wanted to mention to subscribe to our newsletter and stay up to date on all of our programming and, and events that way. You can visit our website at warrenswcd.com. Again, that's warrenswcd.com for more information. And I do always plug this, our Cedar Creek Collaborative, um, which many of us are involved with, um, is, John just got on, great. <laughs> our Cedar Creek Collaborative, our mission is to protect and maintain soil health and water quality in the Caesar Creek watershed. And if there's anybody who's on um, this call today who happens to be in that area or just interested in what kind of work we're doing um, in the watershed there, check us out on our website as well. Um, we formed a group and we're working on specific plans up in this area. And um, in the future, we perhaps will be able to take advantage of some grants and some other available monies um, that might be coming down the pipe to put some of these um, 
cool conservation practices in at um, some of these local farms that we have up there. And so, um, you know, today we're talking about cover crops. That happens to be one of the conservation practices that we always talk about. And, um, you know, so you might uh, take interest in that and just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, but again, if you are interested in this collaborative, check us out on warrenswcd.com for more information under the Caesar Creek Collaborative tab. <laughs> And so this morning, our, our program is called Cover Crops for Soil Health. And we have a couple of few speakers here this morning. Um, first one on the docket is Don Norman. And Don is our National Resource Conservationist. I did also want to mention, and we will have um, slides with their information, um, but we have two producers who are going to be sharing some thoughts and some tips and some, you know, some things um, based off what um, they've been doing at their farms, John Grandstrader and Bruce Goodwin. Um, so we'll introduce them as we get closer to their, their sections. But first I wanna welcome Don Norman. Don Norman should be on the, on the camera. Um, so again, uh, Don is our natural resource conservation, conservationist. Thanks, Thanks, Don. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to try and cover in brief a little bit this morning on the, uh, why to use a cover crop, a good bit about the how and different experiences from our producers, uh, different types of cover crops, um, things that the Soil and Water Conservation District can do to aid in that. We've had uh, an active program for many years now where we uh, fly uh, cover crops into a standing crop of uh, beans or corn um, in the fall, late summer, early fall, uh, with the exception of last year with all the problems that uh, we had uh, last year, we did not have the program. But um, <clears throat> the main reasons uh, for using cover crops are, are many. Uh, maybe the main one in my mind is uh, prevention of soil erosion uh, on crop ground, trying to hold uh, water on the field rather than have an excessive amount of runoff so we can uh, reduce that surface runoff and have additional uptake of moisture into the ground rather than over the surface of it. Um, improvement of water quality is a big aspect of that as well. Adding organic matter to the soil to build it up and uh, add fertility. Um, also increase increasing beneficial organisms, microorganisms, water infiltration, reduction of uh, soil compaction in the field, uh, which has many benefits uh, in itself. Um, providing weed control on the field. Uh, sometimes you can uh, have an aliopathic effect with certain cover crops that will uh, subdue uh, weed growth in your field. Um, help control harmful nematodes in your field and hopefully reduce the need for fertilizer applications. Uh, many different types of uh, legumes that uh, can add uh, <clears throat> nutrients to the soil, uh, cowpeas, winter peas, various types of clover, hairy, hairy veg. Um, there are also uh, grasses, and probably the, the one that's been used the most for several reasons, uh, it's very economical, very effective in uh, controlling erosion on the field is cereal rye. And uh, there are a lot of good aspects of cereal rye in that uh, it's very easy to work with. It's uh, not tremendously expensive. It, can, it has a wide range of, uh, <clears throat> there's a wide window for when you can apply that at the end of your corn or bean crop. And it also grows well into the cooler temperatures as you get into October and November. So we can get a good bit of vegetative growth and a lot of root activity in the soil down to cooler temperatures. Um, where erosion is a significant problem, annual ryegrass is also a good option. Um, oats, wheat, spelt, barley. Um, and if compaction is a problem in your field, uh, there are several different species of brassicas that can help with that. Uh, mainly radishes, oilseed radish, 
tillage radish, forage radishes, um, turnip scale, mustard, and rape. All those things are good for reducing compaction, recycling nutrients, and all the other benefits that we've already spoken about. Buckwheat, uh, it's a fast growing sub summer cover crop, but it's, it's good for nutrient recycling, attracting beneficial insects, reducing surface compaction, and also is effective in weed suppression. Um, as I said, most people who are new to uh, the usage of cover crops will generally go with uh, the cereal rye, but there are many other cover crop mixes. Uh, we're very pleased to have John Brandstrader uh, in our program here in a little bit because he is uh, he's a very adventurous user of cover crops and he's um, kind of building his own mixes and playing with it experimentally over the years. And he has uh, many mixes that go over 10 different um, particular cover crops in the same mix. I've been out to John's farm a few times and seen those mixes growing in the field. And not only is it uh, uh, a wonderful stew of cover crops, but it's very beautiful to look at too. And he can explain to you the beneficial aspects of each one of those in that field as it's growing. But as I say, if you're just starting out cereal rye or some other mix of winter kills, which cereal rye does not, um, is the best way to start out because you're not laying out a bunch of money, but you can begin to see the benefits of cover crops by uh, starting out with that particular uh, species. Recommended mixes, and, and here again, <clears throat> we're really uh, learning every year about uh, the different mixes, but there are some mixes that have been tried and, and proven in the field by uh, uh, Dave Brandt and, and others, as well as Bruce and John here in our own county. Uh, oilseed radish, Australian winter pea, good nitrogen producer, uh, good at reducing compaction, winter kills and is easy to manage. Uh, the management aspect's a, a big part of it because you, you don't want to get a bad experience right away. It might, it might put you off a little bit and uh, getting more experimental with cover crops as, as time goes. Cereal rye grass, crimson clover, and radish is another good mix that provides nitrogen, erosion and weed control, and reduces compaction. Um, a third possible mix is oats, Austrian winter pea, and radish. Winter kills and is easy to manage as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have had uh, the Soil and Water District has kind of taken on to coordinate a fly-on program that uh, I believe one year we had as much as about 2,000 acres fly-on. We'd like to see that grow. Uh, uh, I've kind of coordinated that program with uh, the seed suppliers as well as the flight service that, that applies that on the fields. And if there's anyone out there that's interested in trying that this year, uh, please feel free to contact our office. I'll be happy to uh, explain to you how that works and uh, get you set up. So hopefully we can get some uh, protection on your field this year. Um, <clears throat> good educational tool is uh, MCCC, Midwest Cover Crop Council. And if you get in there, there's various different inputs that you can put in uh, that are specific to our area, uh, our climate, our soils, what particular crop you're using or, or putting in that year. Uh, you can target your selection based upon what you want to see happen in the field. Uh, if uh, you have low nutrients in your field and you want to build it build the soil up to, to get a higher nutrient content in your soils. There are mixes that'll target that. If erosion is, is your biggest problem and you want, to, you want to start working on that right away, which in Warren County, that's the most visible problem that there is out there. Uh, gully erosion, drill and shoot erosion in the fields. So you can, <clears throat> you can target what you want to do and pick the cover crop based upon that.
whether it be beans or corn or whatever it is you're growing that year. Um, can they see this, Cindy? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go back to the one that you just backed off of. Yeah. So the, if you'll see the on the left column are various different cover crop options that are available to you. <clears throat> tells you the type that it is. And the shaded area <clears throat> that, that covers up some of the bars there is basically your, your crop season, your particular crop season. And I, this is the soybean uh, chart right here. So what you're seeing in the shaded area is the growth season of the beans. And where you see bars sticking out on the left and right of that are, are particular uh, windows of opportunity to get that crop established. If you'll notice there, the, the first one, the winter cereal rye, I mentioned you have a lot wider window, it's a lot more flexible as far as getting it in in the fall at the end of your crop or even after harvest. And you can work into much cooler temperatures with the cereal rye there. Um, and I would, I would encourage anyone who's interested in cover crops to get on this, uh, Midwest Cover Crop Council website and just kind of poke around a little bit and see what your options may be for your particular situation. And more of the same as we scroll down a little bit further. As you see, there's um, it's a big old world out there and different cover crops that uh, that you can use uh, for various purposes under under different conditions. So if you have questions for Don, please don't hesitate to reach out to him. There's his phone number in his email and um, give him a call. He'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Don. Okay, so next, oh, here's a list of resources. I wanna add that we will be sending out this uh, uh, PowerPoint to the participant. So you have this list of resources and you have the cover crop school website there. Uh, Cindy, um, um, to last minute, the PowerPoint is actually too large to send via email. Even as a PDF? Even as a PDF. I think we can create handouts. So we'll get it done um, yeah. some way. Uh, but next on the docket is uh, Brandstrader Farm with, and we have John Brandstrader here to talk with us. And John, are you there? I noticed you got on. I just unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Thank you. Sorry for all that hassle this morning. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I was I was I was trying to sign in on the test uh, Zoom meeting, and um, okay. I'm not that great with computers, so uh, it was my fault. Well, you're here, and that's all that matters. So um, again, John Brandstrader, he's a producer here in Warren County, um, and again, I don't know if your farm actually falls within an, uh, Clinton too, um, or if it's fully in Warren, um, but. Uh, John grows specialty crops, including pumpkins and some other things he's probably going to mention here this morning, as well as I think you're still doing some corn and soybeans there on the farm too, right, John? Yes, I'm, I straddle the, uh, the county line. I've got a, a little bit more land in Clinton County, but uh, several, several years ago, I moved my county to Warren County because that's where all the fun was happening. And... Um, you know, there, there was uh, uh, John Tashenko and Tom Spellmeyer, Vince Utrecht, and and just these real leaders um, that, that really inspired me. Because I, I grew up moldboard plowing, and, and we'd moldboard plow, and then we'd fight with the neighbors about who was going to pay for cleaning up the ditches downstream. And uh, it was... <laughs> it took a while for it for it to get, get through my, uh, my, my skull, into my head, the benefits of it, but with the very um, patient, uh, uh, you know, encouragement for, from these in, individuals and and um, uh, Guy Ashmore, and I had no idea I was going to get Don Norman thrown in on the deal. That was that was a, a real bonus. Uh, I uh, 
<laughs> I, uh, I, I, I really uh, did well. So I, you know, I started attending these conservation breakfasts and, and listening to the different, different people talking, meeting everybody. And, and, and it, it, it just took a while for the light bulbs to go off. But once they did, it, it really, it really um, set me afire. And then I was, Ohio State did a, um, a field night um, up at, at uh, uh, Ola, a sweet corn operation up by Troy. And um, I, afterwards, we went by this pumpkin field. It was a no-till pumpkin field. And it was all no-till. And it was beautiful. And the pumpkins were all clean. And um, it, it just, it, a light bulb went off. So I, I started doing that still growing vegetables conventionally with, with raised beds and plastic mulch. And, and, and over a number of years, I watched that soil deteriorate in, in quality and health. And while my, my other fields were, were, were improving and, and quite a bit, I have, I have one field that was 3.8% organic matter when I started farming it. And, and it's, it's now, uh, last year we checked it, it was 49 percent organic matter. Now, the, the, uh, the thought is, is that a percent of organic matter will hold 25, 27,000 gallons of water. So think about that in, say, downstream flooding. And, and I, would, I really like holding water here in case we get a, a dry spell like we did last summer. And, and my, my crops were able to come through pretty well because of the, uh, the residue and, and the depth of the soil and, and the water holding capacity. So, so, so for me, it, it, it's, it's really paying off. Uh, my family's been farming here. I'm fifth generation for 200 years. Uh, we're, we're trying to document it. I think the documents are in some Quaker church over in Indiana's basement. So we're, <laughs> we're trying to figure that out. And then the other call out, I want to, you know, this, we just had uh, International Women's Day. And, and so I, I studied uh, uh, soil science under Elaine uh, Ingham, uh, who did the uh, soil food web research and, and did, learned to use a microscope and look for soil life. And then uh, there's Jill Clapperton, um, Abby Wick, um, and, and then there's, there's Sarah Wright, who, who discovered glomulin in 1996. So a lot of the soil science is, is pretty new. And, and, uh, and, and we're, we're learning all the time. And, and, uh, and, and sometimes I get it right, sometimes I don't. But I, I tend to err on the side of biology and being more of a minimalist in, in chemistry and, and uh, soil disruption. And, and whenever I can keep something green, I, I do. And um, I'm, I'm not too, maybe if I, if I hit my, uh, I can actually see myself what I, what I look like. There it is, I couldn't see myself. And so we, you know, we do some different things. I, I was out um, uh, pulling some, some plants up and this, this is some wheat and the, the, the roots are pretty bare on it. And then, then this, this is rye, and this rye has, has like, I don't know, we call them dreadlocks or, or um, but, but the, there's, there's all the soil life clinging to the roots. And, and as you can see, it hasn't lost much of it. In fact, this will, I've left these overnight. It's called the slaking test, or it's a version of it. And I've left them overnight and the soil still clings to it like jello. And that, that's glomulin. And glomulin really holds our, our farms together. And, and it's a, it's, it's a, a, what is it, a glycoprotein for big words. And, and I, uh, I, I love learning about those kind of things. So let's, uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Cindy, you want to advance the... Uh... Oh, I did. Are you, it's not showing. Okay, yet. we're in the history, Phil. So I'm a... leaving the power of solar energy is up. Yeah. Okay. So, so we, you know, another thing about cover crops is, is that they're, they're absorbing sunlight, and and they're producing these different um, sugars, uh, proteins, oils, and a lot of that is leaked out through the the roots or 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 as a um, uh, an exudate is another word. And, and 40, 50% of the photosynthate can be leaked out. 
and that feeds the soil life. These these uh, so, so that the sunlight is is pushing carbon through the system to, to preserve it into the soil. And and I've got I've recently bought a, a 2015 Chevy Volt. It's got about 35 mile range. It's a plug-in hybrid and 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 I've got 30 panels there. Each one of those panels produces about an amp. That's a 7.5 kW system and it's about a hundredth of an acre. So if you if you multiply that up to an acre, that would produce 3000 watts of, of, of electricity or 700 or I mean of amps or 750,000 uh, watts. And so you think about all that energy strike and these these panels are less than 20% efficient. Now, now plants, you know, as, as we all know, are completely different. They're, they're bio, bio reactors and they, they, these work, uh, the, the solar panels work well in cold in, when it's frozen. In fact, they work better when it's cold because of less electrical resistance. But, but it, I, I use it as a, as a way to think about all the energy striking the earth. And, and if it's just striking bare earth, it's, it's going to warm up the soil a little bit and then it's going to be re-radiated back out in, into the, the atmosphere. But with the cover crops, we can capture a lot of that energy and turn it into uh, sequestered carbon that will then be placed in the soil. And then with the, the help of the, the mycorrhizal fungus producing glomulin, uh, that, then that, that becomes quite durable. It can last for decades, especially, or, or longer, uh, if we don't tell it up and break all that that biology up, and uh, like I was I was in a Zoom meeting the other day, and they they talked you know the uh, a, a cultivation is like a, a fire, and and the, the microbes get a big flush, but then they um, then they crash and they're hungry and they're hot and they're thirsty for the rest of the uh, season, and and it, it's it's a um, it's, it's interesting to, to think about all the energy that we could be collecting and all the carbon and, and then all the rainwater and the infiltration. And, and um, so I, I don't really have livestock that I sell, sell off by the pound, but I have all these night crawlers and, and I have, have these other animals I really love, like the carob beetles and the, 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 the carabid beetles. Um, they attack slugs and, and these, um, and, and so with, with no-till, we're making an environment where, where slugs might be a bit of a problem, but, but if we have a, a healthy uh, bunch of predators, um, then, then the slugs are kept under control. I've not really had a problem with slugs. And, and some of the seed treatments uh, contain um, systemic uh, neonicotinoids that, that the slugs can eat, but they get it on their bodies and the, the beetle jumps on them, bites them, and then that's it for the beetle. It doesn't hurt the slug, but then we have flushes of, 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 um, of these, these different uh, pests. So I, I've been planting some, uh, all my soybeans are without any treatment. I've been practicing with some corn and, and getting mixed results. And so I, I keep pushing towards less, less inputs and and, and our, our efficiency for corn is pretty good on field corn. We get about a bushel for, for six tenths of a pound of nitrogen. And, and then our, our soil tests, we, we go for a, a higher caliber of soil test, of, of soil biological tests. And, and they recommend a lot less fertilizer than, than some of the local labs. Um, and uh, I was uh, asking, somebody was asking me about it and I said, yeah, this, this I was comparing soil labs recommendations for when there was already a high uh, value for, for phosphorus. And, and so something that came to mind was kind of like asking the Marlboro man, how many cigarettes you should smoke uh, is, is one way that I look at it. But um, so, so I'm, I'm spending less money. I'm making, making a profit. I, I was farming 250 acres and, and I said that was a bit too much. So so I'm back to just the home farm now, 170 acres. And I turned the other farm over to a, a young farmer trying to get established and, and, uh, and, and he'll, 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 he'll do well there and, and it'll, it'll give him more encouragement. So um, 
I, um, I, I really want to focus here, where, where I'm, we're, we're not only doing the, the field crops, but we're also growing some heirloom varieties or, or heritage uh, wheat, a hard red winter wheat called Red Fife that was raised here in the 1800s. Uh, Ohio Blue Claridge, which was uh, developed here at the end, you know, the end of the 1800s. And, and uh, uh, Lemmings Yellow Dent, which was a first generation uh, 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 Corn Belt Dent, which was a cross between New England Flints and, and uh, uh, Southern uh, Gourd Seeds. And uh, it's very high in protein. We're, we're pushing 12. 12% protein on, on these, uh, these old uh, uh, open pollinated lines where like field corn is six or seven percent. So uh, it's, it's, and it doesn't require, and we can, we select our own seed and keep our seed. So that, that saves a lot of money. And then I have a mill, uh, a 1940s mill that, that we're, we're producing and we're, we're getting that rolling. We're working with some other producers of the group of us in Southern Ohio that are are, um, are working on different uh, grains for the local grain economy. As we found out with the Corvid, you know, there was a flour shortage. And, and uh, so we, we're trying to be part of the local food uh, exchange and, and so that everything doesn't have to be shipped in and, and, um, and be, you know, treated as more of a commodity. These, these have very good flavor, they're, they're nutritious and, um, and, and all that. So let's move on to the next slide. Why cover crops? So there's a, another um, bunch of good slides. We've got the, um, the, the I'll talk about the, the monarchs. I've got a, I, I had two acres of asparagus and we've cut it back down to the corner in the corner where I had a big uh, milkweed patch. And, um, and the milkweed is the nursery plant for, it, for the monarch butterfly. And so, um, and then, and then the uh, you can see the sunflowers there. That's that's after wheat. We have a multi-species cover crop there. It's got buckwheat in it, and and um, the I'll, one problem I have. I'll go out after breakfast to go do some crop scouting. Next thing I know, it's lunch because I'm I'm laying on my belly looking at at these insects and 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 just fascinating taking pictures. And then on the on the log there, there is a, a rye plant that that has been uh, well colonized by the the mycorrhizal um, fungus. So I'm, I I covered some of it in in the better infiltration. It's I love I love biomimicry the idea of biomimicry where I you know I still have my my cash crop but I in the off season, rather than planting double crop soybeans, which might make economic sense, I want to go and make more biological sense. And so I'll plant one of these big cover crops. Well, after wheat, we'll take off uh, uh, straw, like half the straw, maybe a couple thousand pounds. But then we'll grow this big cover crop, multi-species, maybe 12 species. And, and, and we've done measurements and, and we've measured up to like 15,000 dry pounds of, of residue from all this. And that's just above ground. Uh, it, it's hard to, you know, can you double that with all the roots? I don't know. But it seems to supercharge the soil then for the next crop, which is generally corn or in, in the case of about 15 to 20 acres, it's pumpkins. And the pumpkins really thrive under that system because what I do is I, I, I let it, we don't plant pumpkins to the end of May and, and we um, have, um, I have a crop roller and uh, it might be in one of the slides. And, and so I'll, I'll plant and then I'll roll it down. Then the pumpkin vines come up, the soil is much cooler. The, the uh, weeds are, 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 uh, are not as big a problem. Soil contact with the pumpkins is, is eliminated generally. So I don't have the phytophthora and the different swimming spores. And um, uh, my, my, my pumpkins leaves never wilted all through the summer and we, we had some hot dry days. So I just went out for a big walk and I, I, I didn't get any mud on my boots. And so I can go out and visit my farm. In fact, my neighbor, he likes to come down and, and check his fields from my fields because he can't get on his. And, <laughs> you know, you got, got to love your neighbor. But um, 
the, um, it's just, it's, um, it, it's, it's got problems. I've, I've had a, I've had to clean a couple of tile lines. I, last year we couldn't get in to plant soybeans uh, as early as we wanted to. And, and some of the rye went to seed and I planted wheat and I can, so it, it, there might be a little bit of rye out there. We'll try to sneak it by whoever's buying it. Uh, we'll see how that goes. And, and, but very, really very few. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a 95% win for me. And um, then when I go and I, I, I'll take my uh, trowel and I'll, I'll look at, um, or, or, a, or a spade and um, I'll go and, and uh, what I really want my soil to look like underneath the residue is, is German chocolate cake. And, um, and, and um, I don't, I'm, I'm not really real big on cake, but I do like that one because it's got all the texture, but just think about all, you know, the, 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 um, all the, you know, the nuts and the, and the, the open pore structure of it and, 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 and the, and the, the color and, and uh, making me hungry. So, so that's, that's, that's basically why, why, cover crops so uh, it, uh, it, it helps me say you know I, I, I spend money but it, in the long run I save money because I'm you know it's hard to put a value on on um, on the um, uh, extra organic matter and the extra uh, quality of the soil but um, I think we're uh, we're well ahead by doing it go ahead and advance the the um, slide Again, this is a, another wide cover crop, but it shows your pumpkins in mm -hmm. you know, okay. debris. We, we go out and pick up clean pumpkins. After, we, can get a, we can get a really big rain and go out with the, the, um, uh, the pumpkin wagon. And, and uh, right after a rain, we, the soil has great stability and, and uh, so, the, the structure of it's really nice. And, and I, I may be doing a little damage. I, I'll plant radishes in that spot. And um, I, I over broadcast the uh, pumpkins with, with a, a mixture and, and I get varying degrees, but if there's an open spot, when the pumpkin leaves go off, it, it generally turns green. Right now I have uh, in my pumpkin field, I, I have some uh, winter annuals that, that some people might call weeds, but but even the weeds are, are a type of cover crop. Uh, I, I do keep an eye out for thistle patches and things like that, and so I, I am. I will have to go in with some 2,4-D and and kill off some <clears throat> some broad leaves before and and that. But you can see there on the one slide with the soybeans, uh, that was that was a pretty big crop of rye. Soybeans come up nice. They they, they did well. That rye is laying on the ground. The, the, the night crawlers come up and feed on it. It, it keeps the soil cooler. Uh, a covered soil also, uh, you know, if you think about sunlight striking bare soil, that that has a, a, a detrimental effect on our microbes. So it, it, it creates a, a habitat for them. And uh, and then uh, <clears throat> the, the if you take a soil thermometer, it's quite a bit cooler. Pumpkins are not planted till late, so it's not it's not like you're trying to get in there and plant something in in cold soil in early April. So so for me, it's an ideal crop. Uh, the um, the vines run along it very happily. At each node, they have the potential to root down, and I have very little problem with squash bugs or or, or other uh, uh, insects. And, uh, and so it, it's worked out. It's very important. It, it, uh, pumpkins make up about 5% of my soil or my, my fields, but produce a third of my income. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Shows your cover crop snake. Yeah, if we, I don't know if you can, if you can read that. That's a, that's a, a, what I call a Cadillac mix. That went in after um, um, rye. I mean, after uh, we took the wheat off and, um, and then that was before pumpkins. And I, elimin let's see if this one, um, I, I have eliminated crimson clover because it goes to seed and then it becomes a, a, a somewhat of a weed. 
and in my pumpkin patch and and um, if it was a smaller one it would be all right but i've been out there trying to find uh, uh butternut squash with my feet kicking kicking around and it's not fun and they don't really like being underneath all that humidity but but that show and so we're going to add i think some more oats to that and some other things it's a it's a work in progress it was really beautiful and and then the other thing is is that i, I kind of look at the price sometimes a uh, certain cover crop might be uh, more expensive than the perceived value i get out of it but this way if something doesn't do well something else will i, I do plant this with a 750 drill and uh, and it just it come right up and and um, and, and and then it got kind of dry and it, it did well it thrived and and uh, polycultures like this really do well in in uh, more so than a monoculture of say just dry and and so I get all the biomass that most of that dies down but then the the vetch uh, peas and rye then survive the winter. And then that comes up and, and produces another 10,000 pounds of, of residue. So um, we're, we're, we're making a lot of, you know, we're capturing a lot of sunlight and making a lot of organic matter and, and then keeping the, the beneficials happy. So uh, go ahead, Cindy. Quick. So you, this, this, this is, yeah, you, nothing fancy here with, uh, my my Kubota is the 1990s. Everything else is is uh, is um, older 70s 80s tractors. I I I use that pendulum spreader quite a bit. It'll throw a pattern about 60 feet. Uh, the um, the 750 drill. That's a tried and true. You know, if you can get it calibrated right, uh, it, it does pretty good. And then a, 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 an old uh, a white planter. Uh, what I found after several years of cover cropping is that, uh, and we use a, a seven thousand, a souped up seven thousand plant corn, and is that my soil never really gets crusty. It never really gets hard, and so I can I can run the you know there's no automatic price, down pressure or any of those things, and um, and and so I'm I'm we're getting really good results with this old vintage equipment. And uh, it's all paid for, which is good. And um, I, um, I, you know, I, I sometimes dream about something fancier, but I'd rather take a a, a nice old piece of equipment and and work with it and and uh, and being being debt free is a, a real benefit to sustainability. You know, there's there's biological sustainability and there's also financial. And so we the crop roller there is on the one tractor. We use that. It works well. The, it's like the, the, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. So a really big crop of rye, if it's in boot stage, it's great. If it's pollinating, I don't like it out there. I'm cleaning out my radiator and, and it's just a mess. I, I've seen clouds of pollen floating around and, and they, it's, it's, it's a real mess, but it's better than not having rye. So, so that, that's good. The, uh, the roller does, does a pretty good job. If there's some vetch or peas in there, they have their tendrils is wrapped around the plant and they pull it down. And just the planter alone will do a pretty good job. Uh, I, and corn, I really like having, and pumpkins and really everything. I like having the cover crop flat for shading. And, and I feel like it's better for the biology to have it really, really stuck to the ground. It, it, uh, it seems to help. And then the, the, um, the night crawlers and that can get to it and, and it, uh, it, it's doing its job um, uh, doing uh, cycling. In a corn crop, uh, if the night crawlers, everybody's active, they'll clean it up. They're, by the end of the season, there won't be hardly any residue left. And, and uh, so it, it's kind of interesting, you know, the, the better the soil gets the the harder it is to keep uh, cover crop on it and, and I'm I sometimes will shift to uh, uh, starchy you know the the uh, like the the rye and let it get you know hardened off a little bit so that it's got ligands that it can hold up and, and especially with pumpkins I, I want it to last the whole season and um, so um, um, I think that's an, that's enough said about that. The, the, I, I really don't have a problem with things wrapping too bad. The, I've got spiky uh, uh, closing wheel on one side of the planter, 
and um, every once in a while I get a little rap, but that's not too bad. Um, we, do we have another slide? Yep, just things you've learned. So some sometimes I just I it's hard to decide. It's like the the rise getting big, the 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 forecast is for dry weather. What do I do? It's 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 hard to hard to know. You know, like what what do I plan? Um, actually, that's my old Hydro International, and I, I was bush hogging by a mulch pile, and and it, the some there was a weak link in there that broke, and <laughs> we had to tow it home. But it, 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 I use it to illustrate this. It's, sometimes it's hard to know which way to go, so I just I try to I choose biology, and and uh, I, I I choose um, biomimicry, you know, as my um, as as my default and. Uh, and and that generally works out. Uh, I uh, I have very very few regrets. And uh, and is this our last slide, Cindy? It is. Yes. Well, well, uh, okay. You did, you did good because I could not open that because I didn't I didn't pay Bill Gates enough, but um, that worked out just fine. And if there's any questions, and and I have a, a I have a, a brand spanking new website that we're we're pretty well done. And and you can go check out some of the stuff we're producing. Um, you know, you, um, you can get in touch with me. Um, I check with uh, uh, anybody at the office. They've, they've got my number, and I'll be happy. The uh, the crop roller uh, uh, could be for rent. Uh, I, I'd be happy to rent it out uh, for uh, short short spells. I bought it because there wasn't another one around, and 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 it's it's. it's it's good to have tools in the toolbox, but you know a lot of this stuff sits around most of the time. And, um, and with that, uh, thank you for for listening. And and if we have, and I'll take questions now, if 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 that's appropriate. Well, John, we're going to wait till Bruce after Bruce's talk just to keep it moving. Okay. But we really appreciate you coming on and sharing your thoughts and your operation with us. Um, and hopefully someday we can get out there and see it in person, maybe if you <laughs> if you that. I've learned I've learned so many things from doing farm visits, and and like the one uh, at Fulton's where where we went, I went to to study sweet corn. I decided I didn't want to grow sweet corn, and but I I found I learned something about pumpkins. So you, you never know what you're going to learn. So, so with that, I'll mute myself and turn it over to Bruce. Thanks, John. Oh, shoot. Yes, we have video. And I'm not sure if people can hear these, but I will try to play at least this one, which it doesn't sound like you can hear it, but very neat. This is from John's farm. Some of those beneficials that we, we sure need more of. Oh yeah, that's that's where I'll go out crop scouting, and and next thing I know, I'm late for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> but then, yeah, those those monarch caterpillars are, are really striking. There yeah. he is. There he is. Okay, Bruce, are you available? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for getting on this morning. And so we have Bruce Goodwin with Goodwin Farms here to share a little bit about his operation. And Bruce is a Warren County farmer um, and grows corn and soybeans and cover crop. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, yeah, Goodwin Farms, we're southern, southeastern Warren County and northern Claremont County is where we farm, do 24 acres. We raise corn, soybeans, and winter wheat, have some hay, got a beef cow herd, cow, calf, take it all the way, sell freezer beef. Uh, operation was started, my father and grandfather started it back in 1950 and operated as uh, part-time farmers, basically till time I got out of college about 1981. Uh, became full-time farmers at that time as a partnership. My grandfather passed away, and it was my dad and I, and I bought out my father about, I think it was 1998. And right now, we're operating as a partnership with my wife and I. Uh, first started doing a lot of no-till. First no-till crop we planted was in 1984. 
the no-till as much as we can since then. Depending on the previous fall, we're farming down here in Illinois, Illinois in glacial till soils, which are impermeable. So in the fall year, sometimes you got to put tracks in the field to get your crop out. So that limits how much we could have no-tilled. Uh, but about as far as that as we could go and uh, started, started putting in some cover crops. I had a couple of uh, good mentors in uh, Tom Spellmeyer and Vince Utrecht, who were on, I was on the soil, soil and water board with, who uh, they uh, talked about growing cover crops all the time. And I was pretty skeptical about how they'd work down here in my soil. Because when we start, started got out of college and started doing soil testing, our organic matter and our soils was testing between half and 1%. And water won't go down, so you had to have sun beat on it in the spring to dry it up so you could plant it, so you could work it again. And you ended up with getting soil getting more compacted over time as equipment got bigger. You end up with ponds in the field. You had to wait for them to dry up to get planted. Uh, there had to be a better way with these guys' foresight. And with uh, lowering my skepticism a little bit, I started trying some uh, cover crops. I think the first cover crop we did was with a fly on. We were convinced by Don Chushenko, who was our DC at that time, with the uh, with a soul SCS at that time, and RCS. So I can't remember, it's been a long time ago, but uh, we flew on the right cover crop. It was before uh, Roundup Ready Soybeans. Uh, we had benefits with the rye. In fact, we, it's easy to no-till into, and it uh, where the rye was, we didn't have any couple birds to kill with herbicides. So that was a big benefit at that time with cover crops. Uh, but like I say, skeptical, so it was on and off with cover crops. Basically fly on whenever the spirit hit me right or whatever, until, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, and we got more serious with cover crops. Uh, where they're wet soils and with crop insurance, we ended up having prevent plant acres in the uh, 2000s started. Uh, first, we was using wheat for cover crop and the way we can do better than that. You know, wheat root system shallow, so we gotta do something better. So we started doing some other cover crops. And the biggest thing you notice right away with the cover crops, you know, uh, you get a big rain in the spring and the water coming off the field, it's not chocolate, it's not chocolate milk anymore. And you start think, seeing yourself, the clear water coming off your field and you start thinking to yourself, why? Why am I not doing this more? Because that chocolate water coming off our fields had all the fertilized and nutrients we put on the year before. So we got more serious in cover crops. Uh, it's really hard to get it done. You know, you're, you're in an economic business, so you want to grow as much crop as you can to the acre to make enough money to stay in business for another year with low commodity prices. And uh, to make the most money, you're growing full season crops. You got to plant them early and you harvest them late. So there's not much time of the year, you know, and it's fall of the year, you're busy. And the last thing you want to really be worried about is, is uh, planting cover crops. But you know, it's got to be a priority to get it done. Uh, the truck, the, you know, you, you run up, you know, John had the tractor going with the wheels going both ways. And it's kind of like trying to get your crop planted and get your cover crop on. You watch the weather and the soil gets too wet and, and or is the soil too dry. You know, we flew on before and flying on cover crop is a really good way to do it if, if you have some soil moisture. But if it's if this if you if it's dry in the fall and a dry fall, you know, always remember if it's dry, don't fly because you're going to waste your money. Uh, and and you're running up against this deal. The fact is, the last two weeks of September, you get more growing degree and, and growing weather than you do the whole rest of the fall. So you you harvest your crop, and if you don't get it off till the middle middle of October, what can I plant? What can I grow? And, uh, and uh, basically, cereal rye is the only thing you can grow. You know, you, 
we used to use wheat when we first started, but wheat puts grow at 40 degrees. Rye will grow all the way to, to when the ground freezes. Uh, so you get a benefit of using cereal rye. And that's what we started using straight cereal rye. And uh, we no-till beans in it the next spring. We have no-till corn in it and got, got really good results. But uh, we still have water places in the field that hold water. So we started putting some uh, radishes with it, with our tap roots. A uh, couple of times in prevent plant, we've used uh, peas and radishes, trying to bake, break up the hard pan where the winter peas makes nitrogen, the radishes scarf up and get really big. Uh, which by the way, when the radishes de decompose in the winter time, they uh, make a terrible smell, it smells like a natural gas leak. So then you get the fire department running up down the road looking for a gas leak until they realize it's the radishes rotten. And that still happens today when people are so radishes and get pretty big. You guys can advance these slides a little bit if you want to. Here's a picture, uh, no tilling. Uh, soybeans into rye. I think this was probably three or four years ago. The reason I got these pictures is there was a uh, coyote in the field and there's fawn deer in the field at the same time and uh, took the pictures of the uh, coyote, uh, coyotes looking for the fawn. Just an example how, the, how your wildlife increases with cover crop because there's places for the for some of the stuff to hide, we have more more cover for the for the rabbits to eat and and grow, and the deer to hide. Uh, go on. They're the same pictures. Go on. But uh, you know, when we when I got out of college, we was doing soil tests, and our soil tests were half to one percent organic matter. Today, our organic matter is uh, in our same soil test in the same fields is up to around 3% and it's rising. Uh, to raise organic matter in the soil, you gotta do a couple things. You gotta grow cover crops and you can't till the soil. You don't wanna work, work the soil very much. Uh, and we work it as least as we can. We're trying to build natural soil structure so that the uh, ground becomes more permeable like you know, John said, you don't get as much runoff as Donnie said, the whole list of things that cover crops the benefits they do. Uh, some people talk about reducing fertility. I haven't done that yet. I'm not brave enough to do that, but I'm getting benefits of cover crop in much other ways. Uh, I've learned over time, you know, I used to use straight cereal rye. I've messed around with peas and radishes. I used, uh, uh, annual ryegrass on a field that was pretty rotable. And uh, I haven't done that again because it took me three years finally to get it killed because it's stuff that's hard to get rid of once you have it. Uh, right now, this, this previous fall, uh, after our corn and soybeans, the, the mix we're using now is uh, cereal rye. We're using uh, Valencia clover. I've learned that Balencia clover takes wet feet better than the others and radishes. The, the, uh, the, you know, we've tried other clovers and, and other species, but the biggest limitation we have with cover crops in our, in our uh, Illinois and glacial till soils. If you if you read the soil survey, uh, we have a seasonal high water table, which generally happens in the winter time, January, February, and March. And our seasonal water high water table is the water tables at the surface. So we have to have crops that can grow and and basically stay alive through that period of wet weather, so that when the weather straightens up in the spring that we are able to, uh, to uh, have, this, have, the, have, the, have the plants still there. So when the weather, the soil dries out a little bit and the, and the sun comes, gets long, days get longer, then we have something that stays and grows. And that's, that's why I've done those, those species. Uh, on our prevent plant ground last year, 
you know, we use, you use a mixture of oats, cereal rye, the same clover and radishes. Uh, you know, we put radishes in our mix every time we seed something. It's kind of like somebody asked me why, well, radishes, you know, they do a lot of benefit. Part of the seed's hard seed. So if you seed it this year, we'll have radishes coming up next two or three years. Uh, as time went on, you know, we got to figure out a way to get our cover crop done in the fall. You know, we had some dry falls where we couldn't fly. How are we going to do it? And, and we ended up purchasing a cedar for a turbotail. You got a picture there of the turbo cedar we're currently using to get our, in the, and we're using rice. So we can plant it later. Uh, some of the pictures is on here. You know, there's a big difference between seeding uh, cover crop rye the first two weeks of October compared to the last two weeks of October about the growth you get in the uh, in the spring of the year and the growth you get in the fall of the year. But you got to remember that a rice plant growing in the wintertime doesn't look like very much on the surface. But its roots are growing and the roots, you know, you'll be, have a crop out there, you can barely see the rye, but the roots are in the ground, you know, two feet. And, and as it grows in the spring, it get, grows better and get the roots go deeper. Uh, I don't know. Some people can can use the cover crops and be able to graze their, graze their uh, livestock on them. Particular operations can do that. And I've done that before with, uh, when I take, when I'm doing corn silage, I plant the cover after that. So I'm able to graze in the fall. You know, there's a lot of things can be done. Uh, I don't know. Biggest thing I can tell you guys is about growing growing cover crops is don't be afraid to fail. Uh, it's the right thing to do. Learn how to do it. Learn how to manage it. And and the big picture is you know you got to look at look at reason why you're doing what you're doing. And that's why I'm trying to do the best for my ground for the next generations. Thank you. And then move on. I got questions. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. And these are all of his grandsons and got a couple more on the way, right? <laughs> yeah. I had three daughters, but I got five grandsons now and another on the way in <laughs> April here. So I got a basketball team now. Yes, you do. <laughs> High energy there. Okay, so yes, we're going to take questions now. If you have questions for any of our speakers this morning, please unmute yourself and, and ask away. You can also type in the chat box. Dylan is helping us um, monitor that. We have nothing as of right now. Okay, so I have a couple questions for the speakers myself. And um, I noticed John mentioned weeds a little bit, Bruce, um, maybe not as much. I, I just want to touch on weed control and how you handle that. Bruce, if you want to go first. Please say that again. I missed weed it. Weed control in your, in your uh, you know, no-till operation. The, the, so right now we're terminating our cover crop. Uh, I like to plant green. I like to let the cover crop grow till we plant. And I then I spray before the crop comes up. Uh, the reason I do this is, is, you know, all living roots in the ground put out sugars in the, in, the, in the soil that the microbes live on. And if you kill everything too soon where there's nothing living, all those organisms will perish and have to regenerate themselves. And I believe that the best way to no-till is to no-till into live or green cover crop. So, so that in, you, in the herbicide I'm using is Roundup, which is a slow kill and takes a while for the plants to die. But the very small seedlings you got coming up don't need all the sunlight right away, you know. And the roots get started so, so, that, those, so that those organisms soil do not perish. They go from the Go from the cover crop to living off the cover crop roots to living off your crop roots, and that's that's the way I terminate. That's the way I terminate mine, uh, just for a fact. That's the way we do it. Thanks, Bruce. 
John, anything to add about we? It, it depends on on um, what I'm doing. Like I'm going to go out and where I have um, a problem with broad leaves. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <coughs> there we go. Um, I'll go out with 2,4-D here after they get gone because I I want to take out, I'm starting to get a thistle problem and, and it's my own fault, but I'm going to, I'm going to hit where I need to with 2,4-D early and then leave all my grasses that will that won't, that won't kill my, my rye and my other grasses. And, um, where I don't have thistles, I'll let the uh, vetch and, and everything else run. Like Bruce, I like to plant green. Uh, mechanically, it works better. If you if you kill your cover crop and it and it and you get a big rain, you're not getting. You, you, it's no longer helping you with moisture. Uh, the the rye has helped me mostly uh, helped me with with uh, moisture management and. Uh, so then I will, depending on what it is with the pumpkins, I, I use uh, the, the, the regular um, uh, burn down and systemic and residuals. On, uh, on corn, I use uh, uh, burn down residuals. And, and, uh, and then on my soybean program, I, I, I can get by on just uh, uh, the, uh, um, all the, the, the non-systemics. And maybe that's why I'm getting a thistle problem, but I, I I try to go as light with the chemistry as I can, and and it's it's fluid as as we know it, it things things develop and and we have but <clears throat> weeds are the the broad leaves are can be harder to kill so I, I I like to take them out when they're smaller, but it, like Bruce said I don't I, I want things to grow and exchange sugars as long as possible. Great. Any other questions we have, Dylan, that popped up? We just got one from Patrick on here. Um, his question is, what is the best way to kill off cover crops without using herbicide? I'll, I'll go first on that. That, that crop, crop roller that, that I have, if you hit the rye at boot stage, or beyond, and it's rolling well, and a couple other ants, it'll crimp the stem and kill it. And then at the same time, if you have vetch climbing up it, it'll kill the vetch too. Now clover, a lot of these cover crops will, will not uh, be all that affected by it. But for peas, vetch, and, and um, rye, if you hit it right, but there's other times when when it seems like it's it's harder to kill. You need your field awful. It's challenging, but the uh, the goal is to is to use less less herbicides and use more uh, cover crop and mechanical methods like that to take care of our weed problem. A good heavy cover crop is a herbicide. Thanks, John. Anything else to add, Bruce? If you're not going to use herbicide, basically you're limited to uh, rolling with the crop roller. Okay. Any other questions, Dylan? Oh. One other thing, the the you know you could plant winter kill cover crops uh, like oats and and radishes uh, would die off with the the uh, freezing temperature of winter. Um, that was the only other question I had. Um, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to pop in the comment box. Otherwise, um, that's that's all we have right now. Okay, great. Um, again, I appreciate everyone joining us this morning. Speakers, John, Don, Bruce, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. And with that, I think we are done for the day. Also, Ash, thank you for joining us as well with Farm Bureau. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good job, everybody. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Have a great weekend.